Welcome to video three. All right, so I want to talk about um, qualitatively factors that affect reaction rates. What make what would make it speed up, and what would make it slow down. And they fall into a couple categories. Uh, five actually. Number one is the nature of the reactants. Um, some reactions just inherently are faster or slower than other than others. And there's not really much we can do to change that. So we'll focus on the ones that, as experimenters, we do have control over. And one is the concentration of the reactants. So all other things being equal, you know, the same reactants, if you change the concentration, the reaction rate generally changes, as does temperature. The presence of a catalyst also makes a difference. And as a subcategory of that, uh, sometimes the details of the catalyst, if it's a solid catalyst in particular, its surface area, some other like stuff like that has an effect too. Our main focus here is gonna be on the top three, the concentration, temperature, and if there's a catalyst there or not. And all of these things are explained quite nicely at a qualitative level um, by this thing called collision theory. And this is based on the very simple premise that in order for a reaction to occur, a couple things have to happen. First of all, they have to collide, but it is not enough that they merely hit each other. Nature is a little pickier than that and they have to collide with proper orientation and with enough energy. The result of that is that any given instant, there's really only a small fraction of the, of the collisions that meet both criteria. So if you actually do the numbers, they're pretty astounding that even the average beaker sitting in front of you in the lab, back when we sat in the lab, the things there are the molecules in there are hitting each other billions of times a second but quite frankly if only if one in in one out of every billion of those collisions results in a reaction that's actually an exceptionally fast reaction but let's talk about how concentration and temperature actually affect these and can make it either more it can make these collisions either more or less effective but first let's actually talk about some of these particularly i'm going to start talking about orientation effect first so here's a reaction um, ozone reacts with nitric oxide to form oxygen and no2 and when this happens in the upper atmosphere this is bad because ozone in the upper atmosphere is kind of what we need to keep ourselves um, protected from uv lights now Look at the reaction, and maybe I will give you a clue, not a clue, but a reminder that NO2 has this basic structure. Okay, it's actually, if you want to do that, that, and that. So the big thing here is that nitrogen is in the middle. Now I have two proposed collision orientations here for you. And I'm gonna ask you, which one do you think is more conducive for this reaction to occur? So think about it for a second. All right. So if you look at the, um, the reactants and the products, see how that changes. So we need to essentially take an oxygen atom off of the ozone and then stick it on the, the nitric oxide. But that oxygen is going to be attached on the other side of the nitrogen. So look at what's colliding with what here. In this case, the oxygen that's already on the NO is colliding with the center oxygen of the ozone. So what would need to happen to make that work? Well, a lot 
Um, first off, you would have to somehow break one of the oxygen oxygen bonds in ozone. But then the problem is that that oxygen atom is actually in contact with the oxygen atom that's already on the NO, which is not what we want. That, that one of those items, let's say it's this one, would have to go all the way around here. And that's a lot of work. What happens here? Well, the collision is going to be between the nitrogen and the oxygen, so that setup is already there, and all that has to happen is for that bond to break. So clearly this is a orientation that is more amenable to this particular reaction. So they have to be lined up that way, and this will not result in a reaction event. Now, you have, you have a little bit of leeway, um, but so orientation matters. So and this is, that's an example of that. The second criteria, and you can figure out that maybe out of all possible orientations, let's say 5% are amenable to this reaction. When people did that, they figured, you know, what happened is the numbers they got still, the reactions were still way too slow. So something else needed to be met. Um, another criteria, and that's the second one, that they have to be energetic enough. So we're still going to be talking about this reaction, but looking at the energetics of the whole thing. So this reaction here is exothermic, and I'm going to show you. So this is energy right here. And you know the energy change of the overall reaction would be this much. And it's exothermic, so we can say that it's less than zero. And this could be delta H as well. They're fairly synonymous in this case. A couple things to notice, though, that reactions are a series of breaking old bonds in the reactants and making new bonds in the products. And you cannot make the new bonds until you break the old bonds. And that always costs you something. And that something has a name. It's the, it's the activation energy. And that is shown by this arrow right here. And that's the energy that it takes to essentially break this bond before you can make that one. Now, in reality, and that energy has to be supplied somehow for this reaction to occur. And now in reality, I should say that the bond breaking and the bond making tend to occur nearly simultaneously. And what you have, if you can watch it really, really, really close, like on the time scale of 10 to the minus 14 seconds, is this thing here, an activated complex, which is sort of a halfway structure. And what that is, is the lowest energy structure that provides the activation energy that can make the reaction go. So this energy needs to be supplied to make this halfway structure. And then at some point, what happens is that this bond is broken here. This one is strengthened. And you now have an oxygen atom and an NO2 molecule. And then energy is given off. Now it's quite possible that once this reaction occurs, the energy given off by the first, that, you know, the first pair that react can supply the activation energy for the next one. But how does it get started? Where does that activation energy start from, or where is it supplied? Well, it's supplied in the form of collisions. All right. So, and we'll get to that in a bit. All right, so this is this is something called a reaction pathway. And so what, what should you be able to know about this? You should be able to point out what the activation energy is. You should be able to tell me whether it's exo or endothermic. and point those out on the graph and what the activated what the activated complex is. 
So if I gave you a, a graph like this for a different reaction, you should be able to point those out for me. All right, and so then the reason why you know, the whole purpose of this was um, that enough, at least this much energy needs to be supplied for the reaction to occur on top of them being lined up right. All right, so this is, in, uh, people often give altitude changes as, a, as an example of this. So if you are determined to drive on a good chunk of I-40, you could, let's say, start in Amarillo, Texas, which is at about 3,600 feet, and end up at the beach at Santa Monica, California, I mean the city anyways, 100 feet above sea level. But in between, there's gonna be Albuquerque at 5,000 feet. So even though you were, even though you're looking at a net drop of 3,500 feet, you actually have to go up 1,400 feet before you do that. And energetically, this is kind of the same thing. So why does concentration matter? Um, well, quite simply stated, a concentration is a form of number density. And the higher the concentration, the higher the density, the more often collisions are likely to occur. The more often the collisions occur, the more often a reaction will occur. Hopefully pretty straightforward. Why does temperature matter? Temperature matters because of the activation energy. So you may recall curves like this when we were talking about gases that um, talked about which fraction of energy had a certain, which fraction of the molecules had a certain kinetic energy. And this is where the activation energy comes from. They collide and the energy of that collision, that kinetic energy can be used to start the bond breaking process. So this curve right here, the blue one, represents your molecules at a low temperature. Now the activation energy for a particular reaction they're different for each reaction, but they're a constant amount. And let's say it's here. So what this graph is telling us is that this fraction, so this entire shaded blue area here, represents the fraction of your sample of reactant molecules that are going fast enough that should they collide in the right orientation, um, that you can that the activation energy will be supplied. So what happens when you raise the temperature? Now remember the average energy shifts and the distributions broaden, but the activation energy is the same. So now instead of just this blue area, what we've got is the entire area under the red curve. So the red stuff on top of the blue stuff, including the blue stuff under it, has enough. So that is, a, so that relatively small, so sometimes a relatively small increase in temperature will result in a much larger fraction of the sample having enough kinetic energy. And that's why generally when you heat things up, the reactions speed up. And it's because more of them have a kinetic energy that is enough to supply the activation energy. So why do catalysts matter? Well, catalysts allow a particular reaction to go via a completely different route. And more importantly, one a route with a lower activation energy. So going from, so it is, again, this magnitude right here versus this magnitude right here. So what that means is that So if you have a lower activation energy, which we call EA, that means that a larger fraction will have a kinetic energy greater than the activation energy. And typically, again, when the reactions are catalyzed, they go by a completely, completely different mechanism that is not possible at all without the catalyst. So that's usually how they work. Um, the overall delta H, 
is unchanged. Um, so the overall thermodynamics doesn't change, but the rates usually go do go faster. And the last point, and in many cases, the thing I'll add is that um, very often there's more than one transition state or activated complex um, in the catalyzed versions, and you can tell how many they are by how many peaks there are. So in this case, there's going to be two of them. All right. Many catalysts are solids. And a lot of times the way that they are constructed, and specifically the surface area, makes a huge difference in, in how they work. So an example of that is one of the uh, two catalysts that you have in a that you should have in a car, which is the one that breaks down or that breaks apart the carbon monoxide. So it turns out that under the conditions in your average internal combustion engine, that the um, the fuel, basically octane, is not completely oxidized to carbon dioxide. And in many cases, it just leaves as carbon monoxide. And carbon monoxide, and there's some unreacted oxygen that goes in there too. Carbon monoxide is very bad. Um, it is very, very toxic. And if you breathe it, it replaces the oxygen in your hemoglobin and does not pop out, um, rendering that red blood cell useless. That's that's why it's poisonous. Um, the problem is that breaking that CO bond actually pretty tough. And so is that oxygen oxygen bond as well. So it turns out that molecules like carbon monoxide um, have a pretty high affinity to a lot of metal surfaces. Now, unfortunately, this is not cheap metals. This isn't something like iron or lead or zinc. It's platinum and palladium, which is why the catalytic converters in your cars are very expensive. But what happens is that the interaction between the oxygen and that metal surface actually weakens the carbon oxygen bond to the point where um, it allows, it does two things. It weakens the carbon oxygen bond. It also completely breaks apart the oxygen oxygen bond in the O2 molecule as well and which makes it much easier for this oxygen to bond to that carbon atom, making carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide has nowhere near the affinity for that metal surface that the carbon monoxide does, and it pops off and goes out into the air, um, not poisoning your blood, but still greenhousing, so there are other issues. And it turns out that this only works if the surface is made just right. It has to be a very fine surface, thin layer, very clean. Um, now, in your and this metallic catalyst is actually deposited on a clay substrate. So if you've never had the pleasure of having a catalytic converter open on you, um, the inside kind of looks like kitty litter, just very expensive kitty litter. Now the other kind of catalyst is one that you've got coursing through, well, coursing through your veins and in various parts of your body. Um, these are called enzymes, and enzymes were thought to be some, you know, magic black boxes until biologists started to think like chemists. And so it turns out that the kind of sugar that your blood can digest or that your body can digest are what are called monosaccharides or single ring sugars, either glucose or fructose. Table sugar, for example, is called sucrose, and it's actually two rings joined into one. You can tell by the fact that this formula is almost double what these guys are, and water is the difference here. So this is called hydrolysis. Um, name, which means literally water splitting. So the sucrose reacts with the water molecule and splits up into glucose and fructose. The problem is, left to their own devices, this reaction is painfully slow and you would die of starvation before this actually happened. That is not good. So why are we still here? Sucrase. Sucrase is an enzyme. It is a big molecule, big enough that we don't even bother drawing the structure. We're talking about 10,000 atoms in it or something along those lines. But what is important, this is the way most enzymes work. Most enzymes are made to either join two small molecules into a larger one or to break a large molecule up into smaller parts. So this is obviously the latter. 
And what happens is there is a place on the outer surface of this sucrose molecule that has a very specific shape, a shape that matches sucrose quite nicely, but not perfectly. So we're talking about hydrogen bonds because um, sugar is a very good hydrogen bonding molecule. And so what's going to happen there is that that interaction as the sucrose tries to work its way and distort itself a little bit into that space on the sucrase, that the link between the two rings becomes very weak and then the water can come in, attack it, and then the two the two atoms are the two separate monosaccharides are formed. And it turns out that separately the glu the glucose and the fructose don't fit nicely into those into that spot anymore and they pop out and then your body does whatever it's going to do with that and then the next sucrose comes in and the cycle gets complete complete and it is because of the weakening of this bond that this reaction gets much much faster and that is only possible because of the presence of that sucrase enzyme so that was a quick overview of on a molecular level how certain things affect molecular reactions the next and last video is that we're going to start to quantify this and start talking about, thing, about a thing called the rate law. So take a break, come back, and we'll see you then.